just to make some money. So these days I get five to 20 messages from unsolicited from parasitic open access journals every day. And everybody except Kate and Lindsay probably thinks I'm a pretty nice guy. But when it comes to those open access journal messages, the parasites, I, wrote, I write back extremely impolite things just because I didn't ask for an email. Science doesn't write me emails. Uh, the journal Ecology doesn't write me emails. But the International Journal of Scientific Research wrote me three this morning. And it's all about predatory publishers. So if you read, you know, for example, let's, let's read about International Journal Sorry, it's a little slow. Yeah, I'm gonna. So, this is a thing where he's, he's come up with a, there's a, a fringe science paper, kind of a non-science paper that somebody wrote. It's, I, I haven't been following this particular point. Um, And then he goes into that. It's, it's kind of a blog, but then I'm looking for the lists. Let's see. There we go, list of standalone journals. So, take any one we want. So, Oh, that's actually taken us to the journal page. <coughs> Sorry about this. I haven't been on this site in a little bit. Um, I guess I want to do publishers then. So this is, this is the list, and then usually he has commentary on them. I guess what I do is this. So this is one of the publishers that wrote me this morning. Yeah. So it's based in Hyderabad, India. Operates 12 different brands of scholarly <coughs> publishing. So 12 different sets of journals headed by a dubious character who seems intent on conquering all of scholarly publishing, maybe a megalomaniac. Um, update on Omics Group's questionable business practices, describe the man behind them. Anyhow, he got so far into this that he was, he's been sued several times for you know, defamation of, of the good character of these journals. And to date, his, his university has defended him. Um, he's extremely frank. You know, he is uh, a little bit in your face. But if you ever get a, a, see an opportunity to go to a journal and you're not certain it's an above board journal, go to Beale's List and check it out. You know, I don't know all these publishers, and the publishers are always, the, the parasitic publishers are always imitating the names of real publishers. You know, International Journal of Parasitology, I think that's a good journal. International Journal of Parasitological Research, I think that's a bad one. Or Lindsay, we had one with American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and I think it was, which is a real journal and a, a top one. And I think the imitation one was like International Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So it can be hard, and the best thing you can do is look for the publisher and then go to this list. 
Okay? Oh, you know what it no, What, what? <laughs> okay. So, definitely, definitely you want to avoid the parasitic journals. I liked Alex's description quite a bit where, you know, you're attempting to put your research in the best journals, but you're not forgetting the regional journals, national journals that are also part of the science enterprise. And you remember that impact factor is a rigged game, right? If you go to Las Vegas and start playing the slot machines, you can dream of coming away with a million dollars, but those slot machines are set up explicitly so that on average, you lose. Or more importantly, they win. And that's the game with impact factors as well. And then we can also talk about journal characteristics in terms of access. You guys are all working in an African setting. And sometimes when you publish that paper in that high impact factor uh, journal, at the same time, you're making sure that your paper won't be seen by other people in Africa. So I was, I was bothering Alex in Ghana because I think the, the most important journal in his field is an Elsevier journal. And Elsevier is the worst of the publishers as far as access. But, you know. Okay. So let's start talking about the structure and order of writing in science. I have my recipe. And if it doesn't work for you, don't use it. But this is what I do. And to me, it makes immense sense. But the very first thing you do is you produce your figures and your tables. And later on, I'll tell you, please, more figures and fewer tables. OK? Because nobody reads your tables. You're strange. <laughs> but the, the nice thing is, is that that gives you kind of the centerpiece of your paper. You tell me. You read the title, you read the abstract, and then the next thing you read, the thing you look for are the figures, right? The figures and tables then help you write the methods. Again, you've already done the science. You already proposed the hypothesis, tested the hypothesis, well, obtained the data, tested your hypothesis, and got to your results. You know the answer. We're not talking about playing with, you know, revising your hypothesis. We're talking about how do you actually write the paper. So once you have the figures, your methods become easy because your methods are all of, the, you know, where did the data come from and all that up to where you're producing figures and then it's basically I got figure one from here, I got table one from here, I got figure two from here, figure three from here. Okay? You're not going to say that, but that's a very easy, logical structure to your methods. And remember, it's all about clarity of communication. Okay? Your methods map onto your results. And of course, your results are structured in largest part by referring in sequence to your figures. Okay? Now you have the whole middle portion of the paper written, methods and results. And now it's quite easy to put an introduction at the front and a discussion at the end. The abstract, I think it's best to write last because now you see the whole concept of the paper. Okay? One crucial thing is that the last paragraph of the introduction should state pretty clearly um, the purpose of the paper. Scientific writing is not 
artistic, it's not creative, don't be subtle, don't be cryptic, don't be artistic, don't be avant-garde. Just say, the purpose of this paper is to, okay? Um, there's a lot to say about <coughs> length, um, particularly introductions do not need to be very long. What the introduction of a paper should do is to set up the question. Okay, it should establish what is the question and why is the question important. But it shouldn't be a long, random, random convoluted, rambling treatment. The discussion is intended to interpret your results in the broader context of the literature in the field. Okay, again, it doesn't need to be terribly long, but it probably will be longer than your introduction. And one thing that recipe-based science writing leads us to do quite a bit is to repeat. And so try to avoid that as much as possible, where you say something in the results and then you say it again in the discussion. And worse yet, you then say it again in the conclusions. So, you know, try to avoid wasting people's time and wasting people's uh, journal space and things like that, because it's just repetition. So that's the basic idea of writing. Now there are some things we can do with technology that help us quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we do quite a bit in my group, and Kate and Lindsay can tell you about this, is that we use um, group forums for writing and for sharing documents. So if you're working in a, in a collaborative group, just to give you an example, Google Documents is great. Okay, this is essentially, it's like Microsoft Word online, except everybody can see it in your group. You know, so it might be three people. And here, this is a, a, a paper that we were working on about open access. And my friend Mark said, made one comment, and then I made a comment back, and then Mark came back, and then Ada came in. And we got all this commentary. Sometimes it's in line, sometimes it's comments. And then somebody goes through and kind of smooths it out and takes, takes into account all of the, um, the comments. So this is just a way that you can um, coordinate amongst different research groups, colleagues, etc. Of course, the downside is that it's online, so if you don't have constant internet, even here where the internet is good but not great, um, Google Docs would be a little bit uncomfortable to be working on full-time. Uh, we also use Google Groups, and there are other versions of all of these things, uh, but we use Google Groups for um, coordinating our communications and sharing documents, sharing figures, things like that. This is from our niche modeling group and one of the students is, is sending around um, a comment about one of the manuscripts. <clears throat> so rarely will I suggest to you a, a for-pay uh, solution, but this one's a pretty good one. Um, here's the free solution. And I think there's one more that, that I haven't searched out yet. Zotero. Zotero? Yeah. Okay. Um, Zotero. Mendeley was very interesting. It was, it is free and open access, but guess who just bought Mendeley? Yeah. Elsevier. So it's clearly being used for evil purposes, even though it's, it's, open access. It's also pretty useless as far as formatting bibliographies, at least, you know, what I've seen of it. Sean? Uh, also, also, uh, with regard to 
Aha. I think the introduction is designed to get your reader in agreement with you about what the hypotheses are and, and what the research questions should be. But those are stated clearly in the, in the, at the end of the introduction. So, you know, the first paragraph might be a very general statement about the field. And then succeeding paragraphs might take the reader through what has been done in the field, but also what hasn't been done in the field. And at the end of that, it's very easy to say, okay, now you know what's been done and what hasn't been done. Here's what I'm going to do. 